quickly now and uh, we'll of course just give you a bit of background if you if you just tuning in the statistics south africa stats sa says that the expanded definition of unemployment includes discouraged people or those not searching for employment stands at 42 percent of the country's eligible workforce also calculated by age. This number does not only constitute unskilled and uneducated people, but it also includes matriculants and graduates. Now, South Africa's unemployment problem has been documented and well-documented long before the outbreak of the coronavirus. Some studies locate the problem to inadequate education and the lack of skills. So, in 2008, the Department of Higher Education and Training contracted the Human Sciences Research Council to research and establish a mechanism to support skills, planning and the training of students in preparation for the labor market. So let's just uh, welcome our guest back onto the show, Ntombi Zamasala, who is uh, um, She's a strategy director at, the, uh, at Yellowwood. Thank you again. Thanks for staying with us because we really needed to just get sure. a little bit more out of this conversation. The, the last question Absolutely. that we left, we left off with was really looking at the type of work opportunities. You were speaking very much so about how we've moved in the direction of an informal economy and people, you know, standing with signposts, the work of freelancers, that kind of environment. And this is what we are finding more and more happening. But in terms of skills deficit... Are we skilled enough? This is one of the big problems that we are looking at and saying, are we falling behind or are we keeping up with the world? Because this is very, very important if we want to fill these job opportunities that may or may not be there. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I think we can't pretend as though we are keeping up here. The truth is at this point, uh, if, we were to, if we were to take a dipstick, we probably are behind in the pace. Um, I guess the the perspective that we hold from the research that we've done is that there's no way to be able to classify the actual technical skill that that will be required in the future. We can't turn everyone into software engineers, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because that's not necessarily the only job of the future that's going to be required. But if you look at what the World Economic Forum talks about the top 10 skills of the future, they talk about things like complex problem solving, uh, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, negotiation, cognitive creativity. What we can do is really start to intercept ourselves in the quality of the skill that we're facing. Now, I, I want to use a profession that we probably all hold in immensely high regard, the profession of, be, of being a doctor. Right? Everyone has an understanding of what it takes to be a doctor from a technical point of view. But when you look at the kinds of medical challenges that doctors are facing today, there are more cases where doctors need to have a sense of empathy and humanity than they do necessarily the dexterity of being able to cut someone. Now, we are building machines that can operate with greater proficiency than any human being can. They can, they can use a scalpel with far greater dexterity. What you need a doctor to be able to do is to understand the root problem, to be able to engage with another human being. So when we know that even the job of something as physical and as tangible as a doctor is going to change, what we can start to do is to relook really what do we invest in from a skill point of view for young people. Um, and, and I think that that's really for, for us the, the part of the conversation that is quite empty. We're not talking about the, the nature of people, uh, how, how prepared are people for change. Mm. And if you look at the challenges of poverty that people have, have faced, the truth is that we're actually probably better prepared for change than any other population in the world. The amount of resilience that our population has, the ability to deal with things changing at a rapid pace is already built into our nature. Yeah. And so we believe that if we can focus on those top 10 skills, we actually might be ready for the reception of the changes in the technical requirements. I, I like what you say there because, you know, th- this, is, this is the time for change. And we very well may have fallen behind in years and generations before but this is the the world is is now signaling massive movement and massive change and this is where we can actually jump on board but are we jumping on board and are we doing it fast enough because there are companies that are doing it and doing it exceptionally well however one of the things they complain about is that there are not enough skills so we land up importing skills into the country to try and fill these positions. And then you just see the unemployment rate getting higher and higher and higher. uh, And the youth particularly are the ones that are affected. And that's who we are focusing in here. So 
let's let's talk about subjects then. For instance, at a South African mm-hmm. schooling level, do they meet the needs mm-hmm. of the labour market? They, they don't. Um, and a lot of the education experts that we spoke to, uh, certainly when we we're doing our research, were quite honest about that that the nature of the curriculum is traditional. It's largely colonized. It's serving a labor force um, that actually doesn't need that skill anymore. Right? Uh, there's a lot of root learning and a lot of obsession with uh, knowing parts of things that are actually not necessarily, or, or rather knowing parts of subjects that are actually being computized right now. And so absolutely, the, 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 the subjects that we're teaching and the manner in which we're teaching them are not ready. But I do have to give credit to the fact that there have been some efforts in transforming the curriculum. So when you look at a subject like LO, right, um, it, its attempt was absolutely to be able to prepare young people for a version of the world that they hadn't been taught in the past. So when we look at the curriculum, we see the fact that we have the capacity to change it. We've done it before. And what we've got to, what we've got to do now is really focus on, on, on giving young people the opportunity to be more familiar with what the expectations will look like. We're raising a generation of what I guess are being called digital natives. That they're children who are being born with the idea of technology being a part of their existence. So it's not that we have to teach a child how to deal with a computer. They yeah. know how to deal with that. What we have to face is, is this child's ability to, com- to, to, to imagine a world where their relationship to an external device is different? Are we preparing them for the fact that they have to collaborate with this team in the morning and then do a completely different function in the afternoon? Are we teaching them to aspire to more than just one profession in one lifetime? And I think that that's the, that's the curriculum stretch. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and I think that that's really what we've got to look at is, are we having a conversation early enough with young people about the nature of, of uh, careers that they want to be able to build for themselves and then letting them experience an education system that explores that with them? Far too often, I think we are obsessed with getting people into streams yeah. because that's how the world of work has been in the past. The sooner you can be a brilliant accountant, uh, the better. The sooner you can be a brilliant biologist, the better, because time in those industries makes a difference. What we're finding now is you're seeing a biologist jump to engineering, an engineer jump into marketing, a marketer jump into accountancy, and that's largely because of their ability to just flex into different spaces. And I really think that that's, that's what we've got to try and push those who are shaping our curriculum, not only at a basic education level, but certainly at higher education and tertiary, to reimagine what we are taught so that we are ready for what's coming. Yeah, it, it's, so, it's so fascinating what you're saying because you're touching on so many interesting things. I mean, we may push our children to become accountings, but there are such incredible software programs out there that do the accounting for yeah. you. You don't need people to do that anymore. Um, I mean, I, I, I look at last year, you gave that such a great example, it just popped into my head. I mean, I looked at last year and the advent of a pandemic. And, you know, when, when a lot of people thought about it as a, as a, a wasted year, I, you can sometimes argue that away because this, yeah. the, what we are going through still and what we went through particularly last year, to see a young child, literally at grade R or double R level, sitting on a computer learning skills that you perhaps would never have learned before and you would have carried on, you know, the same way. But these skills are now entrenched into them. We cannot just go back to the way things were. Once we all get vaccinated and whenever that may be that we go back to the way things were, we can't do that. The problem is, is that it's that divide where you find that, of course, those that have the data available, those have got laptops, those that have have got the ability to go to a school that can do online teaching or go to a university that will allow them to do these courses. But that is speaking to the minority and not the majority. So there's my Absolutely. problem. There's the big problem. What do we do as a government to fast track this for future job preparation? Yeah, I, 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 I want to echo that sentiment. You're absolutely right, Leanne. Um, I think one of the adages that have been said for decades and decades that are absolutely true today is never waste a good crisis. Um, and I think what 2020 did is that it presented the nature of crisis for us that can create some common ground for the first time in a very long time in this country. We all have the same problems uh, and they're presenting themselves in almost an identical way. Um, I think perhaps the, the, the biggest thing that we need to reimagine is, is this idea of whose responsibility is it to reshape South Africa. And I'm by no means excusing any government institution in this 
But I think one of the unique things that South Africa has, not only because of the size of our population, but the manner in which our democracy is formed, is this idea of the interconnected parts of our society. We've never been able to operate with government doing one thing, civil society doing another, uh, corporates doing a different thing. And now more than ever, I think the idea of having a common goal is all the more important. So if, I, if you might just uh, humor me a little bit, and let me explain what, what I mean. is If you look at a corporate who needs employees, the most important thing for a corporate to do right now is to make sure that they have an employee set who can perform, vested interest. The government needs to be able to boost an economy in order to be able to get em uh, employment. Civil society needs a functioning society in order to be able to make sure that our democratic functions are actually uh, alive when they work in the way that they are. And as everyday citizens, we have a vested interest in making sure that as you walk out of your own house, you're not faced with someone who, in the absence of a device, a, 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 a megs and bits of data, is unable to educate themselves and get themselves out of a, 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 of a potentially di difficult situation. And I think that that's what we've got to focus on. When I look at the countries who have managed to do this, if you take the example of Singapore, and they really are probably one of the best transformative uh, examples, it was the combination of all parts of society. It's Zama concerning herself with, am I making sure that not only just my child has the device and has access to data? How about one more child? Uh, it's a school concerning themselves with creating connections between schools in the nearby area. So it's not just important that this individual school gets a 100% matric pass rate, but the school down the road. It's, it's the corporates choosing to invest not only in the, the maths and sciences education and giving bursaries to those children, but give bursaries to children who are in the humanities field because you recognize and understand the, the, the benefit of those skills in the future. It's government mm -hmm. looking at how do we intercept not only the big skills and, and the big industries that we want to be able to fund, but how do we make sure that the pipeline of people are actually being sufficiently funded? So it's all of us looking at the same problem and creating, moving ourselves from a common crisis to common ground and really being able to, to mutually invest in that, in, that, in that sense. And I think that once we start that collaborative conversation, I think the president calls it the social compact. Um, once we get quite aggressive and deliberate about that, I have no doubt that our, that our country is at the precipice of being able to truly transform itself. And, and like I say, we have a population of people who've done it before. So we've got the muscle memory for that kind of success. Yeah, yeah. And Tombi Zamasala, what a pleasure speaking to you. Really such an important thank conversation. And, and thank you for allowing us to steal a few more minutes of your time to just continue the interview. And uh, this, is, of course, is uh, a, um, a strategy director. And Tombi Zamasala is uh, from uh, Yellowwood discussing whether there is a disjuncture basically between uh, education skills and the needs for the job market that are out there currently. Let's quickly take a break. We'll see you with Sports News with Venom after this.